dive in with this story here about Claire Daly, because you guys know Claire Daly has been very vocal on the EU parliament floor about how she feels about this conflict between Russia and Ukraine and all wars, to be honest. Uh, she's critically called out NATO. She has given a, a new speech that I think everyone needs to hear. So I have two clips I want to play from her, this new speech, and then I want to go back to a speech that she made in March about what's happening to people in Ukraine because of this conflict. So let's get started with this one here. Now, this comes from Six Side, so shout out to him if you guys know him. He said, everyone needs to watch Claire Daly, Irish MEP Claire Daly with a message for NATO. And I 100% agree. I think you all need to hear this. So let's dive right in. They've overstretched themselves. The people of Europe and the people of the world have absolutely seen through them and their days are numbered. We see the jingoism wearing off. The vacuous call of standing with Ukraine is ringing hollow now. Ordinary people can see that this war is being financed and paid for with the lives of Ukrainians and Russians and with the living standards of the people of Europe. And all for what? All to line the pockets of a military industrial complex which has controlled the US presidency no matter which side manages to win and a military industrial complex which is now taking over the so-called leaders of Europe who are not leaders at all they're actually just followers and wimps generally in uh, the main so they may think that they have their war now and they have their military hardware but that is the last ditch stand because the people of Europe are beginning to wake up the people of the rest of the world have long seen through NATO and the US the global north is now a minority in a new world order which won't be based on the dollar but will be based on a new system of multilateralism the old colonial days of where the western white man came in and dominated they're gone now and this present period, dangerous and tragic as it is, is really just their death agony. You better go ahead and preach Claire. Now I'm going to chime in here. We're going to play this again. There's a couple of things I want to say about the speech that she gave. I think if you have not sent this to as many people as possible, because they really need to hear this message. So let's go back to the beginning here. Let me go back and I'll chime in uh, here and there. They've overstretched themselves. The people of Europe and the people of the world have absolutely seen through them and their days are numbered. We see the jingoism wearing off. The vacuous call of standing with Ukraine is ringing hollow now. Yes, it is starting to ring hollow now because people are starting to see like we've given them billions and billions of dollars but it doesn't seem like there is a resolution that is coming to this conflict anytime soon. And I think more Americans are starting to wake up to this as well. It also does not help that the recent leak of the Pentagon uh, documents also show that there was no plan to try to end this war anytime soon. And that part of this conflict has to do with some type of planned regime change in Russia. So that information is out in the open now. So now more people have woken up to the fact and they're starting to ask these questions. What is it all for? Why are we sending all this money? What is this really all about? So the more people question, the better off uh, we are, I think, in reference to ending these wars and convincing more people to become anti-war. So let's go on. There's a couple other things I want to say. Ordinary people can see that this war is being financed and paid for with the lives of Ukrainians and Russians and with the living standards of the people of Europe. And Let's talk about the living standards. We've been covering this for the past couple of months. The people in the UK couldn't pay for heat. They had to go to facilities called warm banks in order to get heat. Uh, you had an energy crisis that was happening in Germany. We talked about that. We played videos about that on this show. People in France have had enough. The protests in France weren't just about uh, the pension reform. There was also protests in France against NATO. So when the U.S. government decided to put sanctions on Russia, yeah, there's some harm done to Russia, but not to the extent that it is done to their allies in Europe, countries like the U.K. 
countries like France, countries like Germany, they are actually hurting as a result of this, because if you depend on Russia's pipeline for your energy, then yes, if the pipeline is blown up, this is going to be a problem, obviously. So they have been hurt by this conflict as well. So Europeans, I actually think, are even more upset about this war than Americans are. But I do think more Americans are starting to get a clue. All for what? All to line the pockets of a military industrial complex which has controlled the U.S. presidency no matter which side manages to win. No matter which side manages to win. And this is why I continue to say it doesn't matter if we have a Republican that's president or we have a Democrat that's president. It doesn't matter because the military industrial complex controls both parties. That's why we don't see an ending to these wars. That's why the United States government is constantly intervening in other countries. That's why when we talk about bipartisanship, both parties actually agree when it comes to being pro-war. Yeah, you may have a couple of individuals here and there and Congress kind of scattered about that say they're against these wars. But when it comes down to legislation, they tend to vote along with the people in Congress that are not against these wars. And a military industrial complex, which is now taking over the so-called leaders of Europe who are not leaders at all. They're actually just followers and wimps generally in uh, the main. So they may think that they have their war now and they have their military hardware, but that is the last ditch stand because the people of Europe are beginning to wake up. The people of the rest of the world have long seen through NATO and the US the global yep. north is now a minority in a new world order which won't be based on the dollar but will be based on a new system of multilateralism the old colonial days of where the western white man came in and dominated they're gone now we need to talk about this system that she mentioned where it will no longer be based on the u.s dollar look at what is happening right now with BRICS. look at how you have countries like china and brazil and now india other countries choosing to collaborate and work together to have their own currency and no longer depend on the U.S. dollar. She's 100% correct. The old school days of the U.S. government being the police of the world, being the dominant economic figure, those days are starting to go away. And this is also connected to the Richard Wolf story that we're going to get into tonight as well. When he talks about the fact that the U S empire is starting to fall, we have been warned about this. I think for a long time in this country, we have believed that we will always be number one. America will always be on top. Things are starting to change. And I don't think the U S government ever stopped to think that these other countries would decide to come together and collaborate on their own and say, forget the United States. We don't need to follow their lead anymore. We need to band together and do our own thing. And this present period, dangerous and tragic as it is, is really just their death agony. She is spot on. One of the things that I've noticed with this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is that the mainstream media has not been, I would say, completely honest in reference to uh, the casualties, right? Oh, Eric, I think I did something wrong. Could you? I'm trying to maximize this. I did something wrong. I don't know what I did with the tight VNC. I'll let you do it. Um, but they're not being 100% honest about the casualties in reference to this war. You hear them talking about, well, Russia is losing. And is that necessarily true? You hear them tell you that all these Russian soldiers, oh, they're, they have so much loss in reference to Russian soldiers, but they're not telling you about the loss that the Ukrainian soldiers are also starting to have. And Claire Daly, actually, she made another speech. Now, this was in March about the losses that Ukraine is also experiencing, especially when we talk about uh, the, the death toll of the people. Listen to this speech. Thanks, President. Listening to the cheerleading in here, safe and secure, thousands of miles away from the front lines, I think it would be a useful exercise for us to remind ourselves about what ordinary Ukrainians are experiencing. 
The Economist reports of forced recruitment across the country. Draftees with no experience or training are being sent to the front in what a UK minister calls first world war levels of attrition. Casualty figures are secret, but we know there are estimates of about 120,000. You need to know that it's not just men, adult men that are fighting over there. They're recruiting boys, 14 year old boys to fight. To go to their death, basically. And we said this a long time ago. There was no way, I don't care how much aid the U.S. government gave Ukraine, there was no way that Ukraine was going to beat Russia. No way. And so when you hear people make this statement that we are willing to fight to the last Ukrainian, that really means they are willing to fight until every single Ukrainian is dead. That's what that means. I don't know why people are applauding that, but you heard that phrase at the World Economic Forum. You heard that phrase from politicians in Congress. You heard that phrase from the Biden administration and people in the audience are just cheering and applauding as if this is something to applaud. That is not something to applaud. People don't even know what they're clapping for. They just clap just because they're sheep. Let's go on. Battalion commanders tell the Washington Post of recruits fleeing positions en masse. Politico record reports a crackdown on deserters. These are human beings, and there yep. is a shameful lack of empathy for ordinary people in the war rhetoric in here. The debate is about keeping the weapons flowing to keep the war going. Ukraine is burning through a generation of men, sons, husbands, brothers who can never be replaced. They That's right. That's how many people. This is what people need to hear this. This cannot go on indefinitely. And ye sickening war generals who sit in here and will these men to our debts, you make me sick. We need peace. We need dialogue, however unpleasant that may be. We don't have one person like that in Congress. Not one. So... This war is a disaster. It is an absolute disaster. People are dying, which is what happens with wars, but it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think I missed a, well, I'm missing an article here. That's on me. One second. I have an article I want to go to because you need more people to call to an end. Like it has to, you, you, you cannot. And I think some people want to, but I think they're afraid to do so because anytime you have, we're not calling them progressives anymore. We're calling them regressives, by the way. I shouted that out on Twitter. Don't call them progressives anymore. Don't call them progressives, call them regressives because that's actually what they, that's actually what they are. This article here by Common Dreams. Now, this article was published April 17th, but I want you to hear something that it says here. It says, the left and the Ukraine war. To be a leftist in the United States is a dispiriting experience. But in the last year, one of the more dispiriting things has been to see the attitude of many leftists themselves on a subject of crucial importance, the war in Ukraine. The consensus of the Washington establishment remains that the U.S. must support Ukraine against Russian aggression in the form of providing enormous amounts of military aid. We're going to change this word progressives with regressives. Regressives in Congress largely share this consensus, having voted for military aid and even cravenly retracted their letter to Biden in October that suggested he pursued diplomacy. Outside the halls of power too, many leftists effectively support Washington's policies. To be sure, they add the qualification that one must also oppose American imperialism. But when they're supporting a U.S. proxy war, 
that is providing pretext to increase military spending and expand NATO, an instrument of U.S. power, this is an empty qualification. The sad fact is that there is little vocal advocacy in the United States today for the only moral position, namely to engage in immediate negotiations to end this horrific war. And I want you to think about this for a second because you don't see them calling for this. Not Bernie Sanders, not the squad. They've gone along just to get along so they can keep their seats. They're out here pushing for Joe Biden for 2024. These people are failures. And I don't want to hear any more excuses for them. I don't want to hear it. Because to be a leftist, one of the most simple things that you can do is to be anti-war. Simple. To be anti-imperialist. How can you say that you are concerned about climate change? How can you say that you support a Green New Deal? How can you say that you are an environmentalist and you are funding war? The military industrial complex is the largest single most polluter in the world. You are not a climate activist. You are not an environmentalist. Stop. Just stop it. People will ask me, why am I not saying this about the Republicans? I don't remember any of those Republican politicians running on that message. Not one. I don't remember it. That's why I don't talk about it. For the people who say, oh, you only talk about that. If all of those people ran on this message, I'd be ranting about them too, but they did not. So we have regressives in Congress that have actually moved further to the right and embrace this neocon ideology so that they can have a career in politics. Why is this a problem in the larger scale when you look at what it means to be a leftist? It is a problem because it waters down what it means to be a leftist in this country. Now, anybody can raise their hand and say that they're progressive. Anyone can raise their hand and say that they're a leftist. Because of them, because of the Bernie Sanders types, because of the squad, that's why it's a problem. It goes on to say here, instead, most liberals, conservatives, and even leftists seem to support Anthony Blinken's rejection of any ceasefire or negotiations that would potentially have the effect of freezing in place the conflict, allowing Russia to consolidate the gains that it made. In other words, negotiations have to be postponed until Russia is in a weaker position than it is now. In fact, the official U.S. war aim is to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can it can't do the kinds of things that it has done in, in, in invading Ukraine. Excuse me. That means Russia has to be so devastatingly weakened, preferably defeated, that its capacity to wage war is destroyed. But you don't see anybody in Congress saying this about the United States. I don't see any of those leftists saying that we need to make sure that the U.S. ability to wage war has to be destroyed or has to be subdued. This is how you know they're frauds. This is how you know it's fake. All of this madness and ought to be seen as such by an any clear eyed opponent of the U.S. empire before dangerous. Excuse me, before accepting complete defeat, Putin, whom, after all, we're supposed to view as bloodthirsty monster would likely wage total war in Ukraine, possibly include use of nuclear weapons. So anyone who defends the U S war is advocating the destruction of Ukraine and perhaps a nuclear war aggression should indeed be opposed, but not at the expense of human survival or the survival of million millions of Ukrainians. However, strenuously, it has been denied by Western supporters of this war. Russia has legitimate grievances that must be addressed in order to end the killing. It isn't a simple matter of evil imperialism versus a wonderful pacifist democracy. 
Scores of experts, including even cold warriors like George Keenan, have discussed that many provocations from the U.S., NATO, and Ukraine that brought on Putin's invasion, and we needn't rehash the whole history here. What is at stake is in large part a clash of rival imperialisms, a global one, and a relatively minor regional one, which means there is no morally pure outcome as there rarely is in politics. A peace settlement will have to be a compromise, which like most compromises will doubtlessly, doubtless leave all parties what somewhat happy, somewhat unhappy, but at least will end the slaughter. And the politicians that we have, the regressives, they couldn't even hold their feet to the fire when they were calling for some type of diplomacy. They couldn't even stand by a letter that they all signed on. This war is not about saving the Ukrainian people. Anytime they tell you that we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian, you're going to fight till everyone's dead. You're not trying to save the Ukrainian people. This war, which has been revealed through those leaked documents from the Pentagon, this war is about regime change in Russia and supporting the military industrial complex. There's a lot of money to be made here. That's what this is about. And anybody else, especially those who have the Ukrainian flag in their little bio on Twitter, most of those people have no idea what is actually going on here. It is our job to tell them. You have to spread that message. You have to let them know what this is really all about. If there was no money to be made here, this would not even be happening. Almost everything our government does is attached to money. Almost everything. Almost every piece of legislation that they pass has some benefit for corporate power. You have to understand that is why we don't get much. Almost every piece of legislation, even when you look at the climate legislation that they so, you know, they boasted about, there was corporate benefits attached to that. Why else would Joe Manchin sign on to it? The only reason he joined there was corporate benefit attached. So if there's no corporate gains to be made, most likely the legislation is not passed. This is why I continue to say you have to remove corporate money from electoral politics. You have to break away from that until you are able to get Wall Street and the military industrial complex off the back of these politicians in DC, nothing is going to substantially change for the American people. Now I'm not here to tell you that voting for someone is going to change your life. It won't. I'm not here to tell you that if you put this person in office, you're going to get these big progressive gains. Nine times out of 10, you won't. And we need to wake up. People need to wake up to this reality. I'm so sick of hearing this. What about this person? What about that person? This person is going to be the one to change the game. This person is going to go to where Bernie never got to. Bernie could have got there if he wanted to. Okay. Let me say it again. Bernie could have gotten there if he wanted to. Bernie wanted to keep his seat and Bernie wanted to write another book. And he took money from you and he took money from me and some of you canvassed for him and some of you knocked on doors for him and he sold you out two election cycles in a row. This is the reality, people. This is the reality. And right now, he's on Twitter. They've already put the articles out saying he will do everything in his power to make sure that Biden gets reelected. Bernie Sanders is not your friend. Bernie Sanders should not be your acquaintance. Bernie Sanders shouldn't even be in the same room with you, boo. None of it. 
That's my rant on that. Claire Daly, powerful voice. I really wish we had one person, one person like that in Congress. And right now we don't. I'm going to go to some of these comments here. I interviewed her too. You should check out that interview if you haven't seen it. What's up, I Song? Shout out to I Song. Welcome. Th thank you for becoming a new member. Whoop, whoop. Thank you for the super, super, super sticker, Abedin71. Rick says, I sent that daily video to my neocon brother and had a meltdown. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Americans aren't used to hearing that. Shout out to my comrade JB says, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the super sticker, Danny. Savvy, there's no peace talks. Love, it's BS. Yeah. Thank you for the super sticker, Andrea. I can't believe how many people have no idea of what is happening. Mm-hmm. Brainwashed by mainstream media. We're going to talk about mainstream media tonight. Thank you for the super chat. Make the best of what's around. Do you like Dave Matthews Band? There's a song by Dave Matthews Band called The Best of What's Around. That's one of my favorite, say, uh, Dave songs. Yes, I am one of those Dave people. I think people either love or hate Dave Matthews Band. I don't know what that's about, but Savvy is speaking the truths with a passion. And thank you for the super chat, Terry. We must keep up this fight against capitalism like the French. Bingo. The French, they have the right idea. They know where the problem lies. They know. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and hit that like button, guys. That helps me out with the algo. And I'll go ahead and take that comment on Rockfin, Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much for the tip on Rockfin, Diane. Thank you so much.